back again. So we were talking about glucose 6-phosphate and a rearrangement of the molecule. All right, so here is the final molecules. It's called fructose 6-phosphate. All right, so we've got glucose 6-phosphate going to fructose 6-phosphate. All right, so not difficult. If we go back over to this board, we can see in this sucrose molecule. The reason I'm using the sucrose molecule is because it features both glucose and fructose, all right? So I can go back and forth. It's easier for people to see. Even though we're working with the individual molecules and not this disaccharide, which by the way is a disaccharide because it has a bond in between the two molecules, a glycosidic bond. Glyco, glucose, all right? Lysis, cutting, right? glycolysis, see how it all goes together? All right, so if we go back over here, we went from glucose 6-phosphate in a rearrangement to fructose 6-phosphate. All right, now the next step in glycolysis is to add an additional phosphate. So we're going to add another phosphate to fructose. It's going to be fructose 1,6-bis Phosphate, yes, not biphosphate, but bis, B-I-S, all right? So fructose 1,6 bisphosphate. All right, don't ask me why they came up with that. They just did. Unfortunately, as a scientist, occasionally when they discover things and name things, you have to play along with the game. So we've got a phosphate on here. Let's go back to this storyboard. We're over here at step two, fructose 6-phosphate. Right? We needed a water molecule. The fact is the water molecule, which I can put in here is my water molecule, H2O. The water molecule comes into the molecule, but then it leaves at the end. Right? So it's not like we're actually adding a water, water molecule permanently. It does its job, and then it takes off. All right? A reformation. So here we are, step three. Step three. We're at fructose 1,6 bisphosphate when we add this second phosphate. So let me add the second phosphate. So again, phosphate is a PO4 group. Phosphate in the middle, surrounded by four oxygens, so phosphate. So there is the fructose. 1,6 bisphosphate molecule, all right? So kind of neat to play with the ruler. Go to your hardware store and, or go down in the cellar and find an old one and create molecules, so much fun. All right, so there we are, step three. We needed ATP, so again, remember that was part of our prep phase. We needed to add an ATP in the first step. Now in the third step, we add that second ATP, all right? So that was the energy requirement that we needed. All right, back to the enzymes themselves. Let's go back. At the top, we say we see the glycolysis enzymes. We've been to hexokinase, all right? Step two, when we did our rearrangement, this one here, if you want to pronounce it along with me, phosphoglucose isomerase, all right? So isomers are different formations of molecules, so we simply just change the formation. So in step two, we needed an enzyme that would move the phosphate. Actually, it didn't really move the phosphate so much as it changed the molecule from glucose to fructose formation, retaining the phosphate, so an isomerase, all right? First step was a transferase, second step an isomerase, now we're into the third step, all right? So let's go back here. So the third step, we go back down. We added another phosphorus to fructose, so we have a phosphofructokinase, all right? So in step one, we had a kinase where we added a phosphate. Kinases are transferases. Step two, an isomerase, and now we're back to a kinase again. So it's another transfer of phosphate. 
So two phosphates are on the original glucose molecule, which now takes the form of fructose. So fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. All right, let's go to step four. This is where the excitement is, right? We've gone through the adding of the ATPs. Now we've got to cut the molecule in half, all right? So we're going to form two molecules when we cut it in half. We're going to form glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and we're going to form the dihydroxyacetone phosphate. So when we cut the molecule, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, we cut it into two different molecules. But interestingly, in step five, this molecule won't stay as dihydroxy, uh, dihydroxyacetone for long. It's going to form another glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Actually, it's just go up a little bit here. Now you can see why I call it G3P here. See, instead of calling it glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, we call it G3P. And we, we scientists like to do stuff like that. Fact is, if you go back over here, let's go back to step one, just to, re to remind myself about this. Step one, instead of calling it glucose 6-phosphate, guess what? We call it G6P, all right? Pan down to here, number two, we call this F6P. See that? So much easier. All right. So back over to step four, which is going to be a cleavage to form two different molecules. Cleaving mean cutting into two pieces. So let's take a look at our friend the molecule here. So we've got this molecule. Let's go back over here. We're basically going to attack this oxygen atom. So this oxygen atom is going to be attacked. In fact, if you want to go over to this one as well, go over to this board. We can probably play with both of them. A proton, actually it's a H plus, so a proton is also called H plus. H plus, some people call it, call it an acid proton, is going to attack this oxygen so that we can eventually cut this molecule into three carbon units. So three carbons here, three carbons here. So we want to, if you go back to this ruler version of this, we're eventually going to break it into two pieces, all right? So let's take a look, let's see what this would kind of look like. If we go over here, just stretch it out, all right? You don't really have to worry too much about the oxygen where it's going, but we can kind of just let it go like this. So pretty much a linear structure. If you want, you can even put the phosphates all the way out. So you've got three carbons, one, two, three, and another three carbons. Whoops, come back here. Three carbons and three carbons, and we're just per pretty much going to cut it in half. Whoops, come back here. Sometimes it falls over, but cutting it in half to form the two glyceraldehyde-like molecules. So glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, dihydroxyacetone phosphate, which will be converted in a next step to two G3Ps, or two glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates. Okay, so let's go back to the enzymes involved. All right, so we're on step four. We said that we are going to cut the molecule. So to cut the molecule, we use something called an aldolase. So an aldolase is going to be used to cut the molecule in half. And in the fifth step, we said that once you have glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, that's, that's wonderful, you got one of them, we need another one, so we turn the dihydroxyacetone into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate in step five with a, yep, you knew it, an isomerase, right? So we rearrange so that we can get a G3P, you see? So we cut the molecule in half, two different molecules, but we want two of the same molecule. So that's what we're going to see in step six in the end when we try to play with those two molecules, all right? So I'll see you in the next segment. Hi, Dr. Bones back again with my friend Skelly Skeleton. Ah, Skelly's wearing his sunglasses again. Hey, it's summer. I like wearing the sunglasses during the summer. Hey, Skelly, you told me about those two molecules, right? When we cut the molecule in half, we had what molecules? 
Glycerol dehyde three phosphate. Dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Okay, very good. So you cut the molecule in half with the aldolase and you got the glyceraldehyde three phosphate and the dihydroxyacetone phosphate, which when we go back to this board, you'll notice we had a rearrangement so that we could form another molecule of glyceraldehyde three phosphate or what we call G3P. All right, in the sixth step, we are going to add another phosphate. So we are going to add a phosphate and we have something called an oxoreductase, right, with NAD plus, all right? So this is going to take up a hydrogen, form NADH. The molecule, in turn, is called 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, all right? So we're moving from glyceraldehyde phosphate, and we're trying to get further and further toward what we said we were looking for, pyruvate, all right? So we're getting there, so in step six, we added a phosphate, all right, and we have an oxidation reduction reaction going as well. Now, with the enzyme in step six, let's see if we can take a look here. We've got, with G3P, a dehydrogenase, all right? So in this case, it's called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase, all right? In this case, we have two glyceraldehyde three phosphates. We started out with glucose, remember, six carbons, and each of these glyceraldehyde molecules has three carbons, so three plus three, six, so two of these. So this is happening twice, all right? Now, let's move on to step seven. I'm going to uncover the final set of steps. We said there were 10 steps. We have the final set of steps here. I don't know if you can zoom in on that, but we've got, there we go. Let's see if I can move this over. Can you zoom in on those final seven, eight, nine, ten steps? All right, there we go. So we've got step seven in going from the 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate uh, bis, uh, by adding or bringing in an ADP, we are going to start to extract phosphate. So we're going to take out those energies that we were hoping. This is the payoff phase, all right? We put two ATP in. Now we're starting to get ATPs out. And since this step happens for each of the glyceraldehyde three phosphates, two of these are going to form. So two ATP in the end form from each molecule, one ATP. All right, so step seven, we end up forming three phosphoglycerate. So we go from a molecule with two phosphates to a molecule now with one phosphate, but an output of ATP. Remember, this is the energy that we need for cells, ATP. All right, let's take a look at that enzyme. This would be step seven. So step seven Again, we're going to move something around. We call it a kinase, so a phosphoglycerate kinase. All right, so we're going to be moving things around, moving the phosphate, all right? It's going to be moved on to ATP, it goes from ADP to ATP, all right? Adenosine diphosphate becomes adenosine triphosphate, so energy output in the form of ATP, so we need the kinase. Now, step eight, another rearrangement. You'll notice it's Step seven, three phosphoglycerate. Step eight is just two phosphoglycerate. We just move positions, right, in the carbon chain from a three to the two. And again, we have a variety of carbons in the chain, right? But we have the phosphate moving from one of the carbons to the other. In this case, we're going to be moving position, from position three to position two. So not much really happens here except a change in position. So if we go to the enzyme, we see that it's a phosphoglycerate mutase, right? So mutase. I guess you could even think of a mutation, right, in biology, sort of a changing in structure, right? So a mutase. So we're in the home stretch. We're trying to get to pyruvate. We're slowly getting there, right? Here we get to step nine, a phosphol 
uh, phosphoenol pyruvate. You'll notice pyruvate is coming up now. So we still have a phosphate. Don't worry, in step 10 we get rid of that phosphate, right? So we've got a phosphoenol pyruvate, the enol group. You'll learn about that in organic chemistry. All right, so step 10, actually let's go to the enzyme. So it's step nine, we have a enolase, all right? So an enolase in step nine, all right? So let's go back to step 10. Step 10, we've reached our destination, pyruvate, but again, ADP has become ATP. So there is an ATP output, but since we do this twice, right, for each of the G3P or glyceraldehyde 3 uh, phosphate molecules, each of them has another ATP output. That's two more ATP. So that means we started putting in two ATP, but we get four ATP out, all right? So let's go back to the beginning here, if you can scroll over to the prep phase and the payoff phase, you'll notice, yes, we put in two ATP. In the end, four ATP were output along with two NADH. So the net would be two ATP, right? Four out, but two in, so the net result is two ATP out and two NADH, all right? So there you have it. Now the pyruvate is ready to go to the Krebs cycle if you wanted to oxidize pyruvate, all right, for energy. However, sometimes we don't. For example, if you wanted to do muscular work, you can then, in an aerobic, or excuse me, in an anaerobic situation, let me specify that aerobic means with oxygen, O2, anaerobic means without oxygen, so, of course, we have situations where we, the muscles need to work without oxygen. In this case, pyruvate will be converted to lactic acid. And that's the lactic acid burn that you feel in your muscles when you exert. And of course, what happens? You stop exercising and then you, because you have an oxygen debt, we call this. So eventually that, during that transition, the lactic acid's converted back to pyruvate. So it can go back and forth from pyruvate to lactic acid, back and forth, back and forth. Kind of interesting, isn't it? But if you wanted to go into the Krebs cycle, it's a wonderful way to get further ATP, many more ATP, because we've got two of these pyruvate molecules and each of them has three carbons. So we'll do that in another show about the Krebs cycle. Yes, I've got my hula hoop, I've got the hula hoop, and I have all of the steps on the hula hoop representing the Krebs cycle. So we'll see you in the next show. Take care. Bye for now.